Well, welcome everyone. It's so nice to see everybody here. I appreciate you all coming to join us today. Um, we will start today with a reflection. And I thought this was appropriate, especially because we have our first residency class, our first full class. We have a couple of graduates from last year, Dr. Lundy here with us. Um, but we have our first full class graduating soon. And I think this was sort of an appropriate uh, reflection to begin with. So if you'll quiet yourselves for me. We will be known forever by the tracks we leave. Native American proverb. What kind of tracks will I leave through my behaviors, words, and actions today? What prints will I leave on the hearts and minds of others? God with us, you come to live and walk among us to show us the path of life and truth. Direct our actions, our words, and our behaviors so that we leave with others. So what we leave with others will reflect your goodness and compassion. Amen. So I'm excited to uh, introduce our speaker for today's grand rounds, Dr. Kier Mackay. Uh, Dr. Mackay is a graduate of the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, and he uh, came to us with our first residency class, uh, first match in 2020, um, and will be finishing his residency in internal medicine uh, this, I guess, technically end of June. Um, we did our best to keep Dr. Mackay with us upon graduation, but he decided uh, to, uh, to head to Mayo to be an academic hospitalist, which we're very excited about. However, when Riley gets tired of the cold weather up there, the door will always be open for him to rejoin us in our, in our program. Um, he and his beautiful wife, Riley, are uh, expecting their first child in the next few weeks, so we're very excited for you with that, too. Uh, Dr. Mackay is going to share with us his experiences uh, in Kenya through the AMPATH program. So uh, very excited to uh, to hand it over to him. So Dr. Mackay, it's all you. Thank you, Dr. Dunaway, for the introduction. And thank you all for coming. Um, so just as Dr. Dunaway said, so I'm a third year uh, internal medicine uh, resident here uh, at the hospital, and uh, I, I did have a huge, huge uh, privilege to go on an eight-week elective to, to Kenya uh, to Eldoret through the AMPATH consortium. And so this will be a very, very illuminating presentation. I hope it's going to be very, very interactive. Um, I'll try to keep it a little interactive throughout the presentation, but at the end, we'll have a time for lots of questions and answers. Um, so just to begin, uh, before I get into the presentation, we have to address uh, continuing medical education, number one. Number two, I have a disclosure. Number three, I have a disclaimer. And then number four, we'll get into the actual uh, presentation. So first, with regards to the continuing medical education credit. Oh, yeah, one second. Let me move that down. I think it pops up every time I move it, advance a slide here. Okay. Here we are. So with regards to the continuing medical education, uh, you have sheets on each and every one of your tables. Um, so uh, with regards to physicians and nurses, you will be getting credit for this presentation. So in order to frame what you can get, you just have to download the Cloud CME app, and then you have to uh, mark your attendance. And if you uh, then follow the instructions, the activity ID number is 14194. So I do have some disclosures to make, and the disclosures are that I have no financial relationships with any ACC and any defined commercial interest, and I have no off-label or investigate uh, 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 any anything like that in my presentation. No invest, uh, yeah, so no commercial interest at all. And uh, lastly, this this program will be recorded and placed on demand for educational purposes. Uh, if you do take part in discussion or in any interaction that will be recorded, and uh, if you don't want to be recorded, there is a chat box on Zoom, so you can just submit some questions there, and I can answer them uh, at the end of the presentation. So with regards to the learning objectives, first I want to define um, uh, global health. I want to make sure everyone understands the principle and the concept of global health at large. Number two, I want to make sure that you can understand what a global health consortium is. Number three, I want to make sure that everyone can understand the history of the Global Health Consortium. Number four, I want to make sure that everyone can understand the structure of the Kenyan medical systems, understand the roles within Kenyan healthcare, um, that we can all understand the responsibilities uh, during an elective that I was on. But even with regards to what the what a elective uh, looks like for nursing, uh, it's quite similar. So I'll, I can outline that for you as well. And then lastly, with regards to uh, 
uh, making sure that we all uh, understand and appreciate uh, the importance of global health in our local context uh, and setting here in Evansville. So first of all, what is global health? I'm going to open that up for discussion. Um, no pressure. You guys can just shoot, you know, shoot forth with regards to what you think global health is or just take a stab at uh, defining it. Don't worry, I had a full definition, but yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think global health is? Let's go for one of our first year residents. <laughs> I feel like uh, global health is health care that can cross borders, that can translate to anywhere, that can reach communities that might not have access to resources that others do. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. That's a really good definition. So it is an area for study, for research, and for practice um, that places a priority on vulnerable populations uh, around the world and vulnerable communities all around the world. Uh, so us, uh, engaging with and uh, and empowering, and then being involved with uh, with the research and the and the, and the, and the practice um, there. And it's also just it's it's more than healthcare. So it also it's focused upon human behavior. So anthropology. It's focusing also upon economics. It's focusing upon uh, politics even, and it brings all those within the realm of scientific theory and practice, such that we can affect change on a global level. So what is AMPAC? So AMPAC is the academic model for providing access to healthcare. Uh, it's a global consortium of university-based academic centers that's joined with Kenya's Ministry of Health. Um, has anyone heard of AMPAC? Just shoot up your hand if you have. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, excellent. So AMPAC is actually one of the leaders uh, uh, internationally in global health. So as you can see, if you look at some of these names here, you have everyone ranging from, let me use my PowerPoint you're working here. So you have everyone from Johns Hopkins to Duke to Stanford to New York University, University of Virginia, UCSF, University of Texas, these international programs at Toronto, Alberta, uh, this institution from Sweden. So you can see here some very, very um, uh, elite academic centers that have engaged and partnered with AMPAC and actually, the institution that has founded it, the institution that spearheaded it, was IU. And that happened in 1989. I'll get into the history a little bit. I just want to share with you also, with regards to the time when I was there, there was a lot, a lot of physicians present. So during the eight weeks that I was present, we had three infectious disease specialists. We had one nephrologist, two nephrology fellows, one oncologist. I'm not going to go through all of this, but at the bottom here, I really wish that 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 this thing would go away. Can we get some tech support here, possibly, Glenda? Um, but just as that's happening, we did have a CDC researcher that was actually present, um, and he was writing guidelines for CDC on refugee health. And he was a really, really sharp um, uh, individual. He was a graduate of University of Minnesota. And as you can see from some of these some of these names here, uh, like University of North Carolina, like University of uh, Minnesota. Uh, these were, oh, thank you so much. Um, these are not even on the actual impact, uh, uh, you know, global partnership consortium. These are institutions that are wanting to get in, all started by IU, which are program hasn't yet had anyone go um, here in Evansville. Um, but now, now we have, and it really, really is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Right here. Excellent. So with regards to the AMPAC model, what's made the AMPAC model so successful? What's made it so impactful that Stanford, Duke, Johns Hopkins want to be getting involved and, and institutions still wanting to get involved? Well, number one, they've had a, a sustained presence. So they've been there since 1989. They're not parachuting in and they're not parachuting out, which limits the efficacy and limits the impact that an institution can have. They've been there since 1989. They have a horizontal model uh, uh, at work. They really um, uh, focus upon local partnerships, and they really focus on sustainability, <laughs> which is quite unique. You get that, that parachute in, parachute out model, where you really um, can be even handicapping uh, the local population because you're not equipping them, you're not enabling them, you're not educating them, and how are they going to be following up? How are they going to be, um, uh, you know, how are they going to be uh, having, you know, insurance programs set up? How are they going to be, you know, paying for medications? None of that's happening. So this model really, really is very successful. 
So next, with regards to the history of AMPAC, so it was founded in 1989. Um, Joe Mamlin actually was the founder uh, of it. There were several other individuals from IU's Department of Medicine, and there was a new medical school uh, in Kenya called Moy University, and it was looking for help in three areas. Number one, patient care. Number two, education. And number three, research. So with that, um, they reached out to, um, uh, to Indiana University. Indiana University agreed to form this uh, this partnership at that time it was just iu and and those three uh, uh, with uh, uh, more university and more teaching and referral hospital and that was it and then soon people learned of how successful this model was um and uh, an ampac was then created as you can see here with regards to the to the right on the images you can see the three domains number one is the public health uh, system and number two is the academic uh, health science institutions, and number three is the academic uh, partners, and that would be us. So with regards to the, 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 the two on the, uh, the you know, top and the bottom, um, so that would be the hospital that we're partnering with, which is Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital, which is where I was. I'll show you photos of that in, in a little bit. And then that is also with regards to the university, the medical school that we partner with. So we're not just going into the hospital and then coming out, but we're actually going into the hospital, partnering with the medical school, teaching the medical students um, all through, I'm teaching the nurses, teaching all of them, equipping them, enabling them, and, uh, and that is, that's how it works. So with regards to the key principles of the AMPAC, it, it's certainly the shared belief that it is a fundamental right uh, 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 for healthcare, and that a holistic approach is the best way to support the interconnectedness uh, of physical, mental, and social well-being. Like I said, it was designed in response to the need of the population at that time, which is patient care, research, and education. They wanted long-term engagement um, uh, uh, for this endeavor. They wanted a reciprocal partnership. And something unique about AMPAT really is that instead of us going over to them, um, they actually come over to us as well. So every year they send four, I think it's four to six of the, uh, the medical students over to Eskenazi and over to, I think it's 86, 86th Street Hospital, and so they send them over there, and the Kenyan medical students, that would be, I think, uh, year four and year six medical students, I'll explain that in a moment, and then they send over some residents as well, they get exposure to the American healthcare system, so then when they go back to Africa, they're all that much more effective, they're all that uh, that much more uh, insightful, and, uh, and yeah, so the last point really is that they leverage the, inherit, uh, the, the, the power and responsibilities of the institutions here to affect change. So this is actually one of my, um, I have a really soft spot for this slide and that's because in America when we create, you know, vision, you know, mission, uh, goals, we have our strategic spreadsheets. It can seem very cold, it can kind of seem detached, it can kind of seem very lofty, it can kind of seem removed to, you know, the C-suite exclusively. But when ANPAC was creating the model, they wanted to create an image that individuals that had poor uh, uh, levels of uh, education, even just on the cusp of being literate, would be able to understand what AMPAC is all about. And they did it in a very, very successful way. I wish this was actually a little bit bigger, but that's okay. Um, just the, I'll, I'll try to explain it here. So you're coming in from uh, from the from the from the dawn. It looks like coming through here. This says the academic partner set us. You then come into the hospital, and that hospital is Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eldoret, Kenya. You can then see there's a pipeline, and the pipeline goes all the way around. There's, there's wording on each one of these pipes, and that is the different areas that they're focusing upon. And that pipeline's watering a tree, and that's supported by the Ministry of Health, which is like the Ministry of Health of Kenya. And the tree is then watered, and it brings forth security, food security, income security, sustainability, health care, and it it's showing the fruit and the fruition of the efforts of AMPAC. And so with that, you can then see at the bottom is um, a number of pillars that are upholding the, uh, the the institution, the structure. And I just thought it was a beautiful, beautiful image because when you walk through the hospital, there's like there's these posters are probably, I don't know, within 50 feet of every, you know, every 50 feet you see a poster like this. So everyone's on board, everyone understands the vision, everyone understands the mission, everyone understands the goals, which is excellent. Next, AMPAC is no longer exclusive to Kenya. So AMPAC is also now in Ghana, it's in Mexico, and it's in Nepal. So it's self-reproducing, it's expanding and expanding, um, given its uh, incredible success. 
Um, in Ghana, it's led by New York University. So when I was in Kenya, we had a, uh, there was two physicians from NYU. Uh, there was a attending, a, uh, she was actually, so she trained at NYU, she's working at NYU, but she also does some part-time work at Massachusetts General Hospital affiliated with Harvard. And so she, she is a leader in global health. And there was also a, a third year resident there at the same time from NYU. Then there was individuals also there when I was there from Baylor and from a uh, University of Texas, uh, but they do most of their work in Mexico now. And then Nepal is Mount Sinai. If anyone doesn't know Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai is one of the leading institutions in New York City. Uh, it's a very, very well-known hospital system. And uh, yes, so that is the, that's called AMPAT Global. So just take a quick break here, just for some interaction. Can anyone point out Kenya to can, can anyone point it out on a map? I've included all of Africa there. So, maybe. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, right up there, yeah, right up there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. What do we think it's uh, here? I'll use my laser pointer and see if we can. Uh, do we think it's up here? No? I heard a grumbling no. Okay. You think it's east? Okay, so we're some, somewhere around here? Yeah. Okay. Can someone just, oh, here, we'll do warmer, warmer, hotter. <laughs> There you go. It's really hot. Down? Yeah. This, this right here? That's Tanzania. Yeah. That's not just up. Did someone say just up? Just up the that is absolutely right. So that is Kenya. Right here. So this is Kenya. So its neighbors are Somalia. You can see right above on the coast, that's Somalia. Right over to the left. Um, is Ethiopia. So both countries, um, unfortunately, right now are still in civil wars. Um, and then lastly, just uh, so that was like I said, Somalia, Ethiopia, and then here, this is Sudan. North, North Sudan, South Sudan. So these are uh, and, uh, also civil wars in that region uh, or, or around the border of Kenya. So we we're actually not able to go up to within, I think it was 100 miles of any of those three countries' borders. We also couldn't go to the coast. So some of you might have heard of the, uh, the the city called Mombasa. Mombasa is a very well known, uh, very well known uh, sea seaport, sea community, and we were also prohibited from going there for safety concerns and safety, and safety reasons. Um, and so, with regards to the population, it's fifty six million people in Kenya. Um, it's uh, I'm not going to go through the square miles because that matters very little if just those numbers, but it's basically less than the size of Texas. So you have fifty six million people in uh, in uh, you know less than the size of uh, Texas. One, one, one fifth of them are actually located in Nairobi. And um, I was specifically in Eldoret. And Eldoret is where the, the, the hospital was, the Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital. And it was like 8,000 feet above sea level. So I was always short of breath. Like I, it was higher than Denver, Colorado. So anytime I walk to the hospital, anytime I'm like on the patient floors, Anytime there's like a code blue, I'm always like short of breath. Like, you know, yeah. Anytime the heart rate got above like 100, I was like, man. So, um, with regards to the English, uh, or sorry, with regards to the language, uh, it's actually predominantly English. And that is because, does anyone know why the, the language is predominantly English um, if we're in Eastern Africa? What's it called? British colony, absolutely. So it actually was, Kenya was not actually its own country until 1960. Uh, so it actually was ruled by England. It was an English colony, I think it was until the mid 1960s. And so that's why English is still the predominant language. Swahili is, a, is the second most common language. And then there's native dialects. So there's the, you know, the tribal dialects that are completely unrelated to, to one another. There's not even a little bit of overlap between the tribal dialects. So when they come into the hospital, they couldn't even understand my English. They thought my English was truly um, un, un, like incomprehensible. Uh, they thought it was the thickest accent they've ever heard. They needed, they needed to have like some of my colleagues translate for me. And I was speaking slowly and I was speaking clearly and truly. I was having a lot of difficulty with. with... Yeah. <laughs> true, true, true. So, can anyone guess what the, what, the, what the average gross salary is in Kenya? Yeah. So, in America, it's, in America, it's about 52, 53,000 per person per year. Uh, this. Four. Someone said five thousand. Someone said four thousand. Wow, you guys are shooting really, really low. I thought you guys were going to say like thirty thousand or twenty thousand. Yes. So oh, I, I put a star up for you guys there. <laughs> uh, so with regards to it's actually seven thousand, seven thousand six hundred uh, per per person uh, uh, 
per year. And with regards to that, that's also not counting where I was. So that's including all the metropolitan folk in Nairobi. So where I was, there was individuals uh, that were actually making $800 per year. That was their entire income annually, it was $800. Uh, can anyone get to the unemployment rate in Kenya was uh, as well? So in America, I think it's 3.3% or 3.4%. Oh, 40%. 40%? Okay. People agree with that, disagree with that? Did you see my, did you see my slides? <laughs> Just, uh, any, any other thoughts? 30%? I think 30%. <laughs> what do you say, 50? You say 50? Okay. So, with regards, so it all depends where you are. Um, uh, with regards to uh, the whole country, the average is 12%. However, where I was, it was actually 58%. So the community where I was, more than half of individuals had no job whatsoever. But that was not owing to slothfulness. That was not owing to idleness. But there simply was not opportunities to work. Uh, that's why they're on the street corner selling papaya, selling mango, selling you know shoes, selling T-shirts because there simply is no opportunity to work. Uh, that's small business. What's that? That's small business for themselves. That's right. It's a small business, but it's still not recognized as a. Uh, okay, you recognize it as a business. Okay. Fair play. Fair play. So, with regards to uh, the government, it is a presidential democratic republic. It's a member of the United Nations. Kenya is. And with regards to the religion uh, that is largely present, it's a Protestant nation largely. Uh, it's 20% Roman Catholic, 10% Islamic, 8% uh, of other religions, and 2% uh, uh, profess no faith whatsoever. So like I said, with regards to the educational system, and I think this is important specifically with regards to uh, our presentation, because when you go over there, you will, you will, you will if, if any of you have trained in England or in the United Kingdom, you will taste uh, you know, the flavor of, of, of the British training system when you're over there. And so uh, it's medical school right after high school. You don't do a college degree. You don't do any, uh, you know, any undergrad. You go right into, into, into medical school. It's six years all in with nursing training. It's a little bit shorter, uh, but they also do have mid-levels or, uh, you know, NPPAs. Uh, and, uh, and I'll get into that shortly here. So I'm not going to take any time really on this slide because there's still a lot of photos I want to be showing you and everything like that. And so, uh, but I just want to let you know, the stories that you're about to hear and the photos you're about to see are, are uh, representative of a level six facility. Okay, so this is not a level three, this is not a level four. This is a level six facility. This is actually one of the top three hospitals in all of Kenya. Um, Aga Khan Hospital is number two. Yeah, so I believe it's Moy Tijin Referral Hospital number three, Aga Khan is number two, and then University of Kenya's, uh, yeah, University of Kenya's Hospital is number one. So this is, again, re representative of the top three hospital in Kenya. You will not hear about any nurses in Kenya. Nurses do not, uh, you know, exist in the way that we call them. They're called sisters. So it'd be Sister Jane, Sister Mary, Sister Lucy, Sister Kate, Sister, uh, you know, whatever. And so uh, nurses have a enormous uh, burdens in the hospital. They carry about 30 patients. I was, the team that I was on, they were carrying sometimes 35 patients. And these patients are not like, you know, very straightforward, you know, soft admissions. We're like patients that are very, very sick. I remember one day when I showed up, and I'm going to save that for some of the stories that I have. But I remember one nurse on the floor, this was not even in the intensive care unit, had a patient that was having an intraventricular bleed into the brain, unresponsive, cannot communicate, had a DKA patient or a deep diabetic ketoacidosis, which was unstable. There's a patient withdrawing from alcohol having seizures. There's a patient that was combative after a um, uh, after the, kind of the tuberculosis in the brain. There was a patient that had bacterial meningitis. That's five patients. And they had 31 more patients on their list. It was simply unbelievable. Um, uh, the burden that they had to face. And uh, in the Q&A, uh, I'll get into a question that I had was how do nurses even function with 34 patients or 30 patients? And I'll, and I'll answer that in the Q&A if someone reminds me. You gotta answer everything here. Okay, yeah, the, the, there's the MPPAs, there's medical students, and then the physicians uh, in the different levels, you know, interns, and then the registrars, which is the equivalent of residents, and then the consultants or the attendings uh, uh, is, uh, is that. So. So, so first question that people have is, how, what was life actually like over there? How did you get over there? And what was, you know, just, you know, down to earth, tell me more about that. 
So with regards to that, so first of all, you don't travel. There's no direct flights. Uh, I think there's like actually a couple. But for me, there was no direct flights from the United States to Kenya. Okay, so most people, like 90, 95% of people, have to have a connecting flight. For myself, that was actually through um, Europe. Uh, it's either through Europe or through the Middle East. In the Middle East, that would be through Dubai, through Abu Dhabi, through Qatar. Um, uh, but I, I went through Amsterdam or Paris, and then yeah, Amsterdam on the way there, Paris on the way back. When you actually arrive, you stay in the Crown Plaza. That is not optional. That is mandatory, according to the Indiana University, for safety concerns, for safety reasons. Uh, there have been uh, security concerns for American citizens specifically. Uh, in Kenya, some of you remember the, the, the bombing that took place in the 90s. I think it was something upwards of 150 American citizens, which were dead. I believe there was a point blank um, assassination um, in 2009 at a, at a streetlight for the US, for one of the US ambassadors in, in Nairobi. And so they actually didn't let us go outside of the airport grounds. And so the Crown Plaza was where uh, you had to stay. And so then you fly into the international airport of El Doret. It's actually smaller than, uh, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it said like international airport, but I did not see anything bigger than, you know, like, yeah, like a, like a small plane. And so you can see it's a very unassuming um, uh, airport. So you arrive there and then you're now in El Doret. Hardly breathe. You finally arrive, you know, you're 8,000 feet above sea level now. And uh, and then you get to IU House. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's actually a local airline. Now, when you, uh, if anyone's interested in going, um, I can outline all the specifics, but they give you, IU actually gives you all the airlines to be booking through, all the airlines not to be booking through. So they will say, don't book with, you know, so and so, book with Jambo Jet, book with this, um, you know, airliner, such and such. It's actually a one hour flight. If you go by ground, you're not allowed. Because you're not allowed off airport ground in Nairobi, but that would be a five and a half hour drive if you were to drive. But yeah, you basically arrive. I mean, I arrived at, I arrived at 9 p.m. and my flight to El Dred the next morning was at, I think, like 9 a.m. So I just stayed in the Crown Plaza. Yeah. So then you arrive at IU House. IU House is not optional. You stay at IU House. Everyone there that I showed you, those from Duke, Johns Hopkins, you know, like the who's who, everyone's at this facility. You can see it's beautiful. It is absolutely lovely. This is the uh, this is the dining hall here. This, this, this building here, high left above the basketball court. That was my room over here. All these buildings are reproduced on the side from where the photo is being taken, and it's just lovely. It, it's it's a it's really really nice. They give you meals. They they have they have uh, I think four chefs. They cook meals for you. Um, it's really really good. Um, this is Sam. Sam is the security. This is a real photo of him. And so this is Sam. Sam is a security guard, an armed security guard, uh, and uh, uh, he's really, really nice. He always engages everyone coming in and out, and just a really, really nice job, as you can see uh, in this image. Back in here. Okay, so now we've arrived at Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital. This is the hospital uh, on the right side. So with regards to the two individuals that you can see on the right of the photo, they're actually from Brown. I'm not sure if Liz Cho is here. Is Liz Cho here? Liz is not here. Oh, shoot. Okay. Basically, small world. I arrive. These, this gentleman on the far right recently interviewed Liz Cho from Brown University. Uh, and Liz Cho made such an impression upon this, upon this, uh, the director of nephrology from Brown that was here. He was, doing, he was working on dialysis to be optimizing the end stage renal disease. Uh, education and program at this hospital. He was even talking to me about Liz Cho, how wonderful she was, how they really wished that she would match into the program, and then she matched into Brown, like, you know, four weeks later. What is Liz Cho? Liz Cho is a third year resident uh, in the program. So she is, um, she was in the inaugural class with me, and uh, yes, and now she's going to Brown. Um, so with regards to the gentleman on my, or on your left, uh, he was actually a gentleman that was from Kaiser Permanente. So Kaiser Permanente uh, was wanting in on the uh, on the on the AMPAC model. They're actually one of the latecomers to AMPAC, but he was actually coming. He was one of the program directors from uh, from Kaiser. Now, with regards to the left, this is the image of the actual ward itself. So there's about three or four of these cubicles on one side, and then if you cross the the aisle, or if you cross the kind of the yeah, if you cross the aisle. There's three or four on the other side too. So I'm taking this this image right here. If you did a 180 turn, there's another you know four beds just like this. 
what's most remarkable about this image is that, um, as you can see, the beds are not the same, and that it's not just one patient. It's not just one patient per bed. So there's actually two patients per bed. So in this class specifically, you could be having 16. Six, oh, one second. You could be having. Uh, yeah, you could be having 16 patients in that room, not even in count, that's not counting family, that's not counting friends, because in this culture, family and friends are integral. I mean, because if you have the nursing care that you actually had over there, I mean, you will not get fed, you will not get water, you will not get walked, you will not get the care that you need, you will not get turned. So the family is doing so, so much for these patients that again, in these rooms, you almost can't walk. And I felt like really underwhelmed when I took this photo because I was like, wow, this is like the quietest I've ever seen, you know, this, this, this room look. But usually it, you can't even almost sometimes walk through to the end of the wall there. Uh, and I'll be getting to some more stories uh, in, in a little bit here. So just what does a typical day actually look like? So the typical day uh, is pretty standard. So seven through nine, you're gonna be pre-rounding on your patients. At nine, you then do your rounds and you'll be having, you have a Kenyan registrar uh, then there's myself, the North American uh, resident that was present. Um, and I'll just pause right there. It's super, super important that you have the Kenyan registrar with you or the Kenyan resident with you. Because like I said, you can't talk with like 60% of the patients. You can't talk with patients' families. Um, and so it's super important that you have them there. And most days, well, actually like three or four days out of the week, there's no attending there. And the reason there's no attending there is because the attendings actually make around twenty to thirty thousand dollars U.S. per year, so they need another job. So the reason why that you know there's only attending there for three days a week is because they're actually working elsewhere. So we had patients. You might think that you know they come into the hospital, but truly they're like an hour away at another hospital sometimes. So we had patients who would just pass away on our service. We do everything that we can from, our, from like resident to resident, uh, possibly for them, and they just pass away and then just be brought to the morgue. And there's nothing like the, the attendant couldn't come in. It was quite, it was quite bad. So, um, but yeah, most, yeah, around four days out of the week, it would just be um, uh, myself and the other registrar. Um, this is, uh, you know, before I describe the photo. So then you're going to be from 12 to 1, you're going to be writing notes, doing orders. Then you have lunch, then you do lectures, follow up on your patients, um, complete the tasks for your patient care. You'll then be going to the ER and visiting your patients. The ER is unbelievable, it is truly unbelievable. Uh, but I can get to that in a little bit. Um, then I took some Swahili lessons at nighttime uh, with, with uh, Wycliffe. Wycliffe is the Swahili teacher. And, uh, and then you can work on papers. For instance, I did a research paper uh, when I was over there with a very rare uh, case. We can be working on that in the evening as well. And then you have fireside chats. Uh, so in this photo, uh, oh yeah, so fireside chats. Fireside chats are basically um, uh, everyone from Ampath comes together and gets essentially some form of debriefing or educational session from one of the specialists. So if you have a leading cardiologist or a leading, you know, neurosurgeon, like the chair of neurosurgery came over from IU, can't remember his name, I've sent patients to him, but he was there too. And uh, he had a team of six and they just go back to the safari and they're doing one week of work over there. And so uh, you, you, he would talk to us about surgical cases or et cetera, et cetera. In this image, uh, you can see me in the middle there. Um, moving, moving over uh, just to the uh, left, this is the attending, that's Dr. Lou Sweaty. Dr. Lou Sweaty was the attending physician. Two gentlemen on the left there, they are the junior residents, so they are the first year residents. And these first year residents are so proficient, so proficient. They're, they do more procedures in a day than I think I've seen in, I don't know, four weeks. I mean, they are doing they're doing lumbar punctures, they're intubating, they're doing thoracentesis, they're doing super pubic catheters at the bedside. Like it's, a, it's, it's a, like, and there's no attending that they even present to after, like they just, they just go to Mary Ward. And uh, so that was Hussin and Humphrey. This gentleman, um, his name was Peter. Peter is a medical student. He was actually from the University of Kenya. And uh, this is the pharmacy student. And this, um, uh, this young woman, her name was, the second is going to come to me, her name was, Doctor, oh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. I'm sorry, it's going to come to me on the there. Ah, oh, shoot, I lost it. Anyway, she was the other registrar, and she was, oh my word, she was the hardest. She was like so tough on every medical student. You wouldn't, like, she's, you wouldn't imagine it. But I remember she would rebuke and chasing these medical students so tough that I would almost want to just like intercede 
or like <laughs> step in because like she would she'd be giving them feedback they'd like look at their ground she's like look at me i'm talking to you and i'm like oh my heaven it's like you know i was like talking about the harassment like i didn't know what, what to make of that so she was she was very tough and uh yes yeah, so this is the meals so this would be coming to the bedside uh, of every patient if you don't like it you don't eat it there's no diabetic diet okay so you can see there they come in metal pails and in the metal pails you'll have rice you'll have beans you'll have it's like the same thing every day it's like rice beans ugali which is like a heavy starch base it's kind of like potatoes and then i can't remember what the fourth thing is you can see there's two individuals here um and they have plates those are both family members um, and uh, they're getting food because the nurses can't be feeding the patients. They don't have time to be giving patients three meals a day. So most of the families will be feeding patients. Um, and then, uh, yes, this is a fireside chat. So at the fireside chat, this is like I said, everyone comes together and we discuss a topic. Um, this gentleman here, I wish, uh, here we go. I wish you, you could see him a little more clear. He was one of the smartest gentlemen that I've ever met in my whole life. He was a infectious disease neurologist and vascular neurologist, not like infectious disease and neurologist. He was an infectious disease neurologist and vascular neurologist, trained at the University College of London, which is one of the leading institutions of tropical medicine, if you know University College of London. And he was absolutely brilliant. He actually, two weeks before I arrived, went on a camping trip, or no, a hiking trip in Kenya, uh, really close to the border of Uganda, which was having an Ebola outbreak when I was there. And uh, he went hiking and he left his knapsack outside of that Land Rover. And when he got back, he put the knapsack up on his shoulder, he threw it into the Land Rover. They drove two hours to get back to the, you know, back to the, to the grounds. They got there, he grabbed his knapsack, he pulled it out of the car, and there was a huge black snake wrapped around and coiled around and the driver almost freaked out he grabbed him he said like close it like just get away get away get away and, and uh the you know Dave, you know david said is that you know say dangerous he said sir that's a black mamba <laughs> so if you reach to get some peanuts or if you reach to get some trail mix during that you know camp during that drive you might have actually grabbed it yourself a black mamba uh, or come face to face with a black mamba don't worry, there's no black mambas in Eldoret. <laughs> question. Yes, yes, question. Yeah. The patient mood is very high. Yeah. What mood do you mean by? What is that? No. Yeah, the notes. Excellent question. Excellent question. That was like one of my first questions. Was like, how will I have time to write 34 notes? Uh, well, the thing is, you write notes at the bedside with each patient interaction. So what you do is if I was to see five patients, one, two, three, four, and they're in the cot and probably in two beds, right? One, two, and one bed, one, two, and one bed. You focus on the first patient first. And when you're actually doing it, when you're actually examining the patient, someone's scribing for you. So when you're doing subjective, they're writing down subjective. When you get to objective, they're writing down an objective. When you get to assessment and plan, they're writing down the assessment and plan. When, and so when you're actually doing the exam, you're literally just verbalizing it and someone's writing it down for you. So when you're done seeing, you know, patient X, you know, that note's done. They close the, they close it and you and you move on. Uh, but but that's a good point because there is no EMR, right? There is no telephone landlines, right? You can't call nursing station um you, you know down the hall because there's no landlines, you know. And so just operationally, it is so different. And I know that probably might raise a couple of questions in your mind, but yeah, you guys just feel free to interact uh, as you design. Oh, it's back. Oh my word. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. Well, let me try to hide this thing again here. Hide. There we go. So with okay, it'll go away. It'll go away. Okay. So with regards to this is an example of a caseload for one day alone. And as you can see here, is, I'm not going to go through each and every case. This is not like a medical lecture per se to go through the minutia of all the pathology. But I just want to outline just an average day, and this is not even a whole load. This is, uh, you still have about, what am I at down here, 26. So you're still going to have like eight patients on top of that. And with that, I just want to be outlining several stories for some of these patients. First of all, oh, let me go again here. Okay. So, first of all, with regards to, and I'm just going to be outlining five stories or so. With regards to um, the first patient, there's a, a patient that had Burkitt's lymphoma. Uh, this patient was actually 16 years old. You might say 16. I thought internal medicine only focuses on 18 and up. 
That's true. But adults in Kenya are above the age of 50. So I was treating 15, 16, 17, 18, uh, you know, 15, 16, 17 year old uh, individuals. And this gentleman, um, the hospital was so tight on beds and this patient was receiving chemotherapy and was immunosuppressed. However, he was side by side to an active tuberculosis patient that was actually spreading tuberculosis through the whole uh, unit. And you know, one in three patients over there has active tuberculosis. And the hospital is just riddled with tuberculosis. And if you know our hospital, sometimes tuberculosis, they're in a negative pressure room. You know, we're doing absolutely everything you can. You'd be mortified to put a cancer patient inside the negative pressure room and put them in the same bed, right? That was patient number one. And I was thinking to myself, like, oh my heavens, like, is there any system-based change that we can do? Is there anything that we can do to minimize this? And sure enough, on, uh, on, uh, on the second week, he, uh, he actually declined, he actually uh, uh, did not fare so well. Uh, and we actually uh, began our investigations for him. We found out that he did acquire TB, a hospital acquired tuberculosis, unfortunately. Um, and uh, next, we had a patient that had a very large pneumothorax. Um, and this patient um, uh, was in a lot of pain. And I said, okay, how are we, how are we addressing the pain here? And they said, uh, well, we have some, uh, some, we have some morphine order, Dr. Kelly. And I said, you know, I was kind of curious why they call me Dr. Kelly. My name is Kier Mackay, you know? <laughs> and they said the name was way too hard, you know? <laughs> they're, they're just gonna call me Kelly. So, so they said, uh, you know, they said, Dr. Kelly, um, we have morphine uh, and the morphine's at the bedside. And I, and I said, well, which bedside is it? So I'll get it for the patient. And they said, it's right over there. And there literally was like a family playing and there was a bottle of morphine and no safety cabinet because they don't have safety cabinets, of course. And there was just literally a, like 150 milliliters of morphine sitting at the bedside, just as morphine. And uh, I was thinking to myself, like, oh, my, like, that is really bad. Like, someone might, someone might get, uh, uh, like, yeah. So that was patient number two. Uh, patient number three, um, this actually happened on the first day, but um, really, really was upsetting to me. We had a patient that came in with uh, severe, severe heart failure and uh, ultimately went into a form of shock from the heart failure that he was in. And we were doing absolutely everything that we could for him. I was trying to get him transferred to the cardiovascular ICU, the CV ICU. The CV ICU was full at that time. Um, and so we were unable to transfer him. We did everything that we could. Unfortunately, he passed away on our service in the evening. <clears throat> we were notified about that as a team. Um, and when I came back in the morning, again, that, the whole, that whole ward is full. Okay, that's full of people. That gentleman was lying there dead in front of everyone. And he was lying there deceased. And I remember being so mortified, thinking about this man's dignity. Um, and I asked, like, are we going to transfer his patient? Like, why is he, why is he still here? No, like, uh, can, can we give him to the morgue? And they said, Dr. Kelly, the morgue's full. Um, and there wasn't an option. They couldn't transfer him. There's nowhere to take him. Um, so he lied there dead for, I think, like 12 or 14 hours. And it was just awful. Um, it was really, really heartbreaking. Uh, next, we had a patient that had a very large clot uh, in their lungs, was really, really sick. Uh, we did an excellent, uh, not, not we, not me, I'm not pumping my tire, but the team did an excellent job. Uh, he survived, he did very, very well. And uh, uh, I remember he was ready to go. And I was thinking to myself, this John was ready to go. You know, this is excellent. We've, we've done it, we've discharged our duty very well with this, you know? And uh, unfortunately, they didn't let him go. But like, I came back the next day and I put all the discharge orders in, and he was still at the hospital. I thought it was a little bizarre, right? It's like, oh, maybe, you know, family wasn't there to pick him up or something, you know? I asked the team, I said, why is, why is this gentleman not, why, is he, why, why, did not, why did he not go home? And they said, oh, he's a discharged inpatient. And I said, a discharged inpatient? What, you know, what in the world, you know, does that mean, you know? And they said, well, he can't pay for his, uh, for his insurance. So he'll be staying here for uh, 60 days. And I said, 60 days? What in the world? Like, I was like, uh, like he's he's literally like four four beds down from a tuberculosis patient. I mean, not to mention he's not going to be getting you know good nutrition, walking, you know, all this type of stuff. Sure enough, this gentleman was actually there for forty five days because they do not have the insurance plans to send to rural Kenya, you know, to get reimbursed to get refinanced for the uh, uh, for their efforts. So they'll actually keep patients under mandatory like with security in the hospital under mandatory, uh, uh, you know, uh, mandatory, you know, restrictions for up to two months. 
And this gentleman actually, it was a really, really sad case because he was fine. Like after five days, he was perfect, or not perfect, he was in good shape. And uh, he actually, on day 45, he, because he was there for 45 days, he actually had a huge cardiac arrest and died. And it was from a, a large pulmonary embolism uh, because he was at high risk uh, with his uh, immobility in the hospital and completely avoidable, completely avoidable. This gentleman was like 60, like low 60s and he's dead. Um, so like this, you know, I'm not gonna be going through each and every, you know, patient here. This is really just outlining a couple, but I just wanna show you the systems are so different. Like it really is a different world of medicine. Like it's not apple and apple. I remember talking with Kent Brantley. Kent Brantley was a physician that was on the cover of Time Magazine. My cousin worked with him in, uh, during the Ebola outbreak. And um, and so when I was uh, in touch with him before I went to Canada, just to see like, was there anything that I should know? He said that, and it really stuck with me. He said, you can do all the training in the world at Harvard, Hopkins, even Mayo Clinic, and it will not prepare you for Kenya. They do not have this, they do not have the technology. They do not have the, you know, the infrastructure. They do not have the training. They do not have this. And I remember that stuck so deeply with me because I thought to myself, with an interesting global health, oh, sorry. with an interesting global health, you know, you think, oh, if I do all you know, these outstanding fellowships, I well, guess there's, you know, fruitfulness that can come from them and usefulness and service. But at the same time, it is a different world. And that's why I just want to share some of these stories with you. With regards to uh, uh, just a couple, just three more stories, and then we'll move on. I uh, hope this isn't too many stories. But with regards to, um, we had a patient that came with prostate cancer uh, that had uh, acute urinary retention. And uh, this gentleman needed uh, to get uh, that decompressed. And the intern took it, took it upon himself to, uh, to, you know, to intervene. And so he goes and gets, you know, the kit to, uh, uh, with a suprapubic catheter. He comes back and I'm wondering like, oh my word, you're right, there's no attending today. You know, like, or, like this is gonna be an unsupervised procedure. I've never even done a suprapubic, like a suprapubic catheter where you actually have to go in through the skin. Um, uh, right above the bladder, you're actually, it's a surgical procedure, and we have an intern that literally just got out of medical school doing it. I'm supervising, you know, and I can't supervise. I don't know, you know, I'm not in urology, you know, but uh, he didn't need to supervise because he already done like 15 of them. <laughs> you know, I was just along, I was there, you know, but I remember uh, we got to the point of sterilization. And I remember thinking, like, okay, are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna, you know, sterilize this? Like, do we have anything? And, uh, and he grabbed a bottle of Purell, literally brand name Purell, and like with a little hand pump, and he holds it over the belly and he pumps it like five times. And I thought to myself, is that like, is that sterilization? Are you ster is that, or is this like the sterile field now? And he rubs it in, you know, he rubs it in and he just goes for it. I remember thinking to myself like, oh my word, you know, that's not me poo pooing on him at all. Like he doesn't have the, re like they don't have the resources. They don't have the sterile kits that we do. They do not have the, um, you know, the sterilization procedures that we, and the policies that we have that they, they just do not have it. And so I remember thinking to myself like, oh my Lord, like I am not in Kansas, you know, like this is like really, really, uh, uh, so they would like, they, like the, um, what is that? Uh, so there is internet. Oh, in the hospital, there's no computers. I but you watching the YouTube, right? yeah, watching YouTube. Yeah, yeah. No, so watching YouTube. No, I was just watching it in real life. Yeah, yeah. No, no. But with regards to the um, uh, internet, yeah. So I had I I bought service. I bought data, and I was able to then you know reference you know things that I needed to reference because you know our heart failure, our asthmas, our you know diabetes is there. Tuberculosis. That's their cryptococcus. That's their, you know, tropical medicine diseases. So again, the way that they understand tuberculosis is the way that we understand heart failure. So when we think about, you know, the management of heart failure, they have like a six or seven drop down menu in their mind of tuberculosis, you know, and they like schooled me on like three occasions with regards to um, uh, just having off literally the top of their head, literally, you know, the cutoff of the, of the liver function test to be putting on hold for 24 hours before you resume it under a certain circumstance. Like it was impressive. Um, so, uh, so that's not me just saying that, oh, you know, they practice so poorly. I'm not saying that at all. Like they're sharp with what they know, but they do the best of what they have. Uh, two more story, stories. Um, this patient in, in bed 18, um, this is a really, not bed 18, it wasn't bed 18, but number 18. Um, this is a really, really sad patient. He came in with an upper GI bleed and he was very sick. He was unstable. He was like 31 or 32 years old. And uh, so I knew like, okay, this is the high stakes. 
patient. Um, well, every patient's high stakes, but I knew like we really need to be um, getting upon this swiftly and uh, doing the very best we can. And uh, so he came in, his hemoglobin was four. Your hemoglobin should be around 14 or so for him. And uh, with regards to his hemoglobin, it was four. So very, very low. He has practically no red cells uh, in his body. And I thought to myself, oh my word, this gentleman needs to get a scope. I read his history. Uh, it looks like he has, uh, 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 you know, these uh, what we call varices, so in large blood vessels that are likely bleeding. And I said, we need the EGD. And the e this EGD, the scope, is not even so much for diagnosis. This is to be intervening. This is to be stopping the bleeding. And so I, because you can't call the endoscopy lab, I had to walk across the campus, you know, by myself. You know, walked into the suite, the you know, the endoscopy suite. And I said, you know, hi, everyone, you know, I have a patient that I'd like to present to you that needs an emergent, uh, uh, you know, therapeutic scope uh, right now. And they said, what's his hemoglobin? And I said, his hemoglobin is four. And they said, his hemoglobin needs to be 10. And I said, why 10? Oh, oh, I mean, first of all, why can't he, like, with respect, why can't he get it now? And why does his hemoglobin have to be 10? They said, the cutoff at our hospital is 10. And I was like, oh, like, I mean, I can talk with you about, you know, evidence-based medicine right now, but I'm not sure that's going to make much of a difference in, in this, you know, in this context, because that's policy. And I was like, oh, shoot, okay, well, uh, can we, uh, you know, move as fast as we can to get his blood back, you know, everything like that? And they said it takes 48 hours to be getting, you know, a CBC back, you know, a, a, complete, blood count, a complete blood count back. I thought to myself, oh, my word, like, 48 hours, I was like thinking to myself, this gentleman's not going to be alive in 48 hours. And first of all, why are the CBCs, or why is the complete blood count taking so long in the first place? Like, it's just, I was just so frustrated. Anyways, <clears throat> uh, the blood bank was out. The blood bank didn't have any blood. So then you had to contact relatives, and the relatives actually had to give blood at the bedside. And then you're literally transfusing it into the patient. And truly, this is stuff I didn't even know I would even see. Like I wasn't even like I you like prepped me, but when I actually got there, this was like otherworldly. I was thinking to myself, like I don't even know how to navigate some of this stuff. And um, uh, ultimately, this gentleman did um, uh, get a blood transfusion. Uh, the CBC took too long. The CBC took 48 hours, uh, and a day and a half later, he was dead on our floor. Uh, and there was nothing that we could have done differently. I remember thinking to myself, like, is it, like I, I, I debriefed with the attending, and they came back and they said, no, we need to get them above 10. I remember thinking, like, why though? Like, why is it 10? You know? And it was just like, oh, that's policy, and that's what we do. And I remember just being so frustrated. And I'll get into some of how I handled my own, you know, how I, uh, when Dr. Dunway, Dr. Dunway and I were talking after, she said, you know, it might be good to talk about some of the moral distress that you that you faced. Because I'm not even getting into the, the, the suspected Ebola patient that I had that was bleeding out from Uganda and, and everything. But there was a lot. Like that's that might happen in like two days, all these patients. And I'm not even that's only five stories. Um, last story, this is only gonna be one minute. So I could be good on time here, yeah. This will only be one minute. We had a patient that had uh, a nasogastric tube. So a tube going from the nose down into the stomach. And this was also done by an intern with no supervision. And I thought and he did it. it, you know, looked like everything they did was fine. I can supervise that. And so uh, and so he, he placed it. And uh, I thought to myself, well, we're, we're not probably able to get a, a portable chest X-ray. Uh, unfortunately, in the setting, in this context. So I thought to myself, I said to Hassan, Hassan was the gentleman in the bar, I said, Hassan, I said, how are we going to uh, you know, verify placement? And he said, well, just give me a cup of cold water. I said, a cup of cold water? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with a cup of cold water? You know, thinking to myself, like, oh, my word, you know. And so I go, I literally go get like a, a porcelain cup, of, like a coffee cup. I come back and walk into the hospital, almost felt it like work night. Um, I get to the bed as I was with my coffee cup, and uh, he takes the NG tube and he puts the NG tube in the cold water and he says, "You see, is it bubbling with every breath?" <clears throat> I'm looking at it and I'm like, "I see like I don't know, a little bit of bubbles, but not like it's not bubbling extensively with every breath, you know." But I've seen some bubbles. I think, you know, like, I, no, I think I've seen some bubbles. And he's like, "Okay, that can happen sometimes if it's in the stomach. You know, we should be good." And he plugs in the feeding and he walks away. I thought to myself, "Oh my word! Like, I hope it's in the right place." You know, but you, again, you, you can't get the portable chest x-rays. Yes, you can listen with a, steth a stethoscope, um, but no, you can't begin the plain films. So they use the, the, the cold water test. And I thought to myself, like, make or not move. Sir, if you're in the wrong place, like this, this could be resulting in death. Like this is really, really like, but no, it was perfectly, it was in the right place in a good time. But uh, that's just going to show you the, the ingenuity, the creativity that's needed in low to middle income countries, LMICs. Uh, that's a term now for developing countries. They don't use the word developing countries anymore, largely. It's an LMIC, low to middle income.
countries. <clears throat> so that's it. Those are my stories. Um, before I move on, there's still there's we still have probably five, 10 minutes, but does anyone have any questions right now regarding any of the stories or anything in their own mind? Yes, Dr. Sigson. So I've spent a number of rest of my career back at Paul in this rotation. Okay. And they always came back changed with incredible stories that you just did. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the more I've spent over the years, I've always I've come to ask two questions. What did you bring back and what did you leave behind? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Singson, if uh, for those listening, if you did not uh, if, if you did not catch that, um, oh, Glenda, do I need when people give questions? Do I need to to bring a mic? Or uh, oh, Cheryl, you have a mic? Okay, excellent. Well, it's okay. I'll just I'll just verify, but I'll do that in the future. So, Dr. Singson, uh, uh, the program director here, is, uh, was just asking when you're going there and experiencing the the things that you did. What did you what did you learn and what did you leave behind? And that's an excellent question. I would say what I learned was uh, number one, uh, an incredible degree of humility. Uh, I really was humbled every day with uh, with what I saw, not even so much medically speaking, um, but what I saw uh, with regards to how families cared for patients, um, how patients cared for one another. Uh, truly, patients like the patients in the same bed were caring for one another. Um, uh, the gratitude these patients had, uh, the ingenuity that the, that the practitioners practiced with uh, in this, in this low, low middle income country, um, and Truly, Dr. Singson, every day there was just so much to uh, to, to learn uh, that it was almost overloading. Um, so those would be like the five things off the top of my head uh, right now. Oh, and I would also say what I learned was a deep appreciation for what they knew and the context in which they were. Like they really knew a lot. Like if I was a door, I want to be a resident or a junior uh, resident. But if I was to ask a junior resident in the room to off the top of their mind. Give me a diabetic ketoacidosis protocol, like completely, like and write it down on a word sheet and close it and be done with it and then come back the next day, have it that complete, you would not be able to do it. The average intern, first year, would have that completely down pat, like insulin drip orders in the top of their mind. They were, because they don't have reference to what we have reference to. They don't have the electronic or medical record. So I really developed a deep appreciation, Dr. Simpson, for how smart they actually were in the context in which they were. And it made me realize how handicapped we can become um, upon, the upon the structures that we have that we take for granted. And what I left behind um, really was a sense of pride, um, especially practicing over there. Um, it's, it's not that I went over there proud, like high-headed or anything like that, but really when you come back, you just come back really, really uh, like different. You know, like I remember when I came back in the first patient, like one of the first patients when I was with Dr. Butler, with Dr. Butler. yeah, when I was with Dr. Butler, uh, we were doing our hospitalist, you know, uh, a month or a yeah, month together. And one of the first patients was complaining that the Fox News was not working on his 40-inch flat screen television in his, in his room. Uh, and that he wanted this fixed uh, immediately, you know. And I remember thinking to myself, like, like absolutely, we'll get that address for you. That's absolutely fine. Meanwhile, the nurse is coming, bringing him Coca Cola and everything like that. And you know, this care tech coming in, massaging his legs for his venous stasis and everything like that. And I remember thinking to myself, like, oh my heavens, like I absolutely can't do that for you. But like, I wish you knew like how privileged you really, really are, even just to have a room by yourself even more a bed by yourself. So it really just changed my perspective, also with regards to what we take for granted. Yeah, you're the person I asked that to over the years. Yeah, words are different. That's just still the same. Yeah, okay. He says the message is still the same. I'm everyone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll keep moving here, and then just keep your questions to the end here. Um, okay, so what are the challenges with an elective like this? Uh, I'm sure, like even in your own minds, as I've been presenting, you thought to yourself, "Oh my, there's a lot of challenges that likely will emerge." I just outlined several challenges. Um, and number one, it is very unfamiliar. It is very new. Even if you go to Brown or NYU or Hopkins or Mayo or some elective, that's a new environment. And that's like a little overwhelming for a couple of weeks. When you go someplace like this, it's even more overwhelming. So that was number one. Number two, you really see the, the social determinants of health in a brand new way. Um, almost with every patient, you can outline five to 10, like, like very, very basic, uh, or like very, very clear, I mean, um, social determinants of health and how they've impacted this patient. Number three is the frequency of death. I was actually not prepared for this. 
um, IU did a fantastic job. They did a really, really good job with uh, the training before you actually go over. So they bring you up to Indianapolis. They do like a whole day of, of, of all of this. Maybe they did present it. Well, I think they did actually. But I just thought like maybe it was hyperbolic or maybe it was just, you know, like damage control. Like you might see a lot of death, you know? But when you're going over there, and like I said, when you're saying, and it's not just like death that's unavoidable, but death that where you're literally, where the family's like, thank you, doctor, for doing everything that you could. Like, we're so grateful for the way that you cared for our mother. And I'm thinking to myself, like, literally, if we were in America, I, I truly do, and I'm not trying to get like America centric or anything like that, but I really believe this patient still would, would be with us. But truly, the patient's family being so grateful and then seeing all the death and that almost like sticking a knife in my wound, like in the wound, because you're like, oh, like you're welcome for helping, but you know, well, you'll see blood, of course, but you think in your heart, like, oh, that's really, really hard. And that happens every day, every day, every day. Um, and so that was really, really tough. Next, the high likelihood of moral distress. Um, and let me just minimize this here. Yeah, basically every day you're going to be faced with moral distress. You're going to be seeing things that really um, bring things out in your heart from a morality standpoint, right and wrong, which shouldn't, which shouldn't be happening. This isn't right, or this is wrong. This policy needs to change. Like that was a, that was a life that is now lost because of this. Uh, and was, so every day you're going to be wrestling with things like this, and it really does cause a lot of introspection and can even, you know, swing on the side of morbid introspection at the end of the day if you're not balanced and if you don't handle it well. Next, you have fewer faculty, so you don't have as much faculty support. So like I said, you literally have no attending. Like there's no attending. You can't call your attending. I can't call Dr. Lundy. I can't call Dr. Butler. I can't call the whole hospitalist table, you know, and say, I need help, you know, or can you come to the bedside? There's no one coming to the bedside. That's you, you know, and if the patient dies as a result, the patient will die as a result. There's, it's, it's so sad uh, to navigate, but that, that having fewer faculty and less availability was challenging for me personally. Uh, and then just the last point, oh, I wish I had the numbers pop up, but that's okay. okay. Here, let's see if the numbers pop up. Nope, numbers don't pop up, sorry. They should have popped up. Basically five and six. So uh, the last point, just there was every day, it was just like a hose. It really was just, oh, there's so many lessons, professionally, personally, just everything. Every day it was just a fire hose of information and lessons to, to bring on board. So how did you care for your mental, or how did I care for my mental health? How did I care for personal well-being? Well-being being a very important topic and a very hot topic uh, in 2023, and a very important topic. You guys said important, like three times your left, it is important. And so um, I'll just share how I, how I stayed balanced. Uh, and number, uh, number one and two, it was, you know, making sure I noticed the days I didn't sleep well, or days that I did not have a, you know, a well-balanced diet. And the, the diet that they gave was amazing. Like, it was really, really good. But if I was not eating or, or sleeping well, I, like, the days were not going to be good. I'd be really sensitive. I'd be, you know, more introspective, more down. Uh, but that was even more so the first one, because after, after the second one, it's just like, like, it, like, it's normalized now. And that's sad. But like you're not banging your head against the wall that you did, you like for the first month. Like where you're, you literally, it's you almost have like this fatigue of life where you're like this is so exhausted, you know. But when you've been there for a month and you see this every day for the whole shift, it just becomes normalized. Um, and uh, so that was more so the first month. Uh, next, uh, for me, spirituality and my faith of uh, being a Christian is very, very important. And so for me, I'm making sure that I was having time in the Bible and making sure that I was reading God's word and having time just to be journaling and reflecting uh, was very important in my own well-being. Uh, next, getting lots of fresh air, maybe too much because I was like always walking to and from the hospital and short of breath, you know. It's, uh, my Apple Watch is terrible. Basically, it was like, it calculates like a VO2 max, meaning like how, cardio, how much cardiovascular fitness you have. And it was telling me that I had like below average, like four, like a cardiovascular health fitness, you know, like every day with like similar. Uh, lastly, I would address her relationships. So with my wife here, oh, my wife just stepped out. Okay, I was gonna honor her, but yeah. When she walks in, just know that she was uh, super, super important with regards to my family, my friends, uh, super, super important. And also the impact colleagues, they were also, I mean, you just met these people. Um, and yet there was almost a strange, it's kind of like, uh, maybe I shouldn't say that. Oh, maybe I should. Yeah, I say it. It's a poor analogy. It's a very poor analogy, but just like bear with me here. Like, it's kind of like if you go to war, right? And you don't know these people, right? But you're in the trenches, you're like just navigating just hardship and just difficult things. 
like there's nothing at all like apple and apple at all but just like when you're struggling and when you're navigating this with someone else that's also like in the same boat as you there's just this like dependence and support that can come and i found it to be very very uh, a supportive environment so when the nephrology team is telling me oh my heaven like the guy the gentleman that interviewed dr liz cho and was just taken by her like just like they loved her he was saying you know we had a patient today after i shared some stories of uh, you know my team and he said we had a patient today that had sodium you know sodium should be between like 136 and 145 like 135 145 this patient came in with a sodium of less than 100 you know this patient had a sodium of 96 and the bmp there was like the, the you know the test that we're going to be monitoring for the sodium it took us 48 hours to get it back and this patient couldn't go to the icu like we could not transfer this patient and they literally had to keep this patient on the floor the patient seized of course on the floor and they could not transfer this patient and they're talking about that they're talking about how the dialysis machines broke that day and three patients that are dependent upon dialysis were not able to get dialysis. so that type of those type of things where it's just like oh like you get it too like it's really tough on your service as well uh, but at the same time it's very it's very encouraging to say how did you handle that Right. And then he'll give you like, oh, we did this, 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 this. Like, oh, it's just brilliant, you know. Uh, so it's not all negative, but getting to navigate how they handled it was amazing. So they have nephrologists. Oh, we have a nephrologist here and he has a question for me. What's that? They were nephrologists, pretty obvious. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. He says, he says they're nephrologists, so of course they're brilliant. Yeah. So um, we're coming to the end of the present. Oh, what was that? Oh dear, I had a presentation. I had a slide on you, dear. It was uh, this slide right here. I said that, you know, that you were really important for my mental health. So that's what I said. So with regards to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So with regards to, it's not all, you know, I'm sure with what I've shared, it kind of seems like really heavy. Like it's like, oh my word, this sounds depressing. You know, it's not, okay. I hope I hope that I, that I can be balanced for you all. It really is an incredible opportunity and it's not all like just heaviness and difficulty. Here are some wonderful excursions. <clears throat> Has anyone gone to Mount Kilimanjaro before? No one? Okay, good. You know, it's like 19,000 feet. You know, I was short of breath at like 8,000, 8, so I definitely couldn't do that. You know, but uh, Mount Kilimanjaro is like six hours, seven hours away from El Duret. So if you want to go there, you can. I didn't go there, but I put it on the slide because it's interesting. You know, and it's a volcano as well. With regards to Mount Kenya, Mount Kenya is, a, is neglected uh, just because it doesn't have the prestige of being, you know, the top five mountains in the world that are above that height. But it's also like 17,000 feet. Uh, you can go there as well. Mega Mega Rainforest. I got to tell you, I was really disappointed with this slide because in the back on the, uh, you know, when you can see the basin of the rainforest, it looks like shrubs, you know, but these trees are like 75, it's like upwards of like the smallest trees are like 75 feet tall. Like they, it was just a, it was almost like, I've never been to the Redwoods, but I watched Planet Earth and like BBC, like BBC Planet Earth and stuff. And uh, when I was watching, or when, when I watched that, it just seemed so majestic. It seemed so grand. It seemed just so amazing, right? And so when I was there, unfortunately, it looked like really like boring uh, from this image. But th that's the canopy of the rainforest. That's the top of the tree. They're like 125 feet tall. You can see there's like a cloud line above it. It was just beautiful. And this is just some of the team uh, that decided to go on the excursion uh, this weekend. This is Grace on the. Uh, I won't go through all the, the names. This is the this is uh, the Purdue Pharmacy team. They were very, very, uh, very sharp. I think they were final year um, uh, pharmacy students and they were there uh, for, I think, six weeks when I was there. Uh, and they were all very nice. With regards to this young lady on the front right, she was actually the chief resident of emergency medicine at uh, University of Virginia. Her and her friend Esther, they were in the third year residents and they were there when I was there. And there's a couple of attendings at the same time. Uh, and they came with their program director because they wanted to come on the trip and he supervised and stuff. Uh, next, you have the plastic surgery resident uh, and the plastic surgery attendant. He was actually one of the leaders at University of uh, uh, one of the top three hospitals. You know, it's like top five hospitals in the world, uh, according to the, the the new study that just came out from by U.S. Health World News, uh, which is uh, uh, the University of Toronto uh, (TGH) Toronto General Hospital. Toronto General Hospital uh, has you know uh, uh, he used to work at for plastic surgery, and then IU hired him. He focuses upon hands. Uh, and he was doing like incredible work. Even when I was there, there was like large birds that flew into the operating theater, you know, because like it's not closed and you have to have windows for ventilation. 
And literally a bird came flying in and it's not like a little pigeon. Like we're talking like a, like a proper bird, you know, and it's like a big bird and it came flying in and they couldn't get the bird out and it's like a sterile field, you know? And uh, so he was telling about his stories and the nephrology was telling about his stories. And so it was kind of interesting. Like, it was like, oh my, no, but uh, sir, do you want about these? <laughs> so this, this was the New York University team here, uh, just upon his, uh, on the right of them. Uh, that was the New York University attendant. She was the one that did the work at Massachusetts General and at New York University. Uh, and then the, the, the senior resident, who was also a third year internal, uh, internal medicine resident, she was there at the same time. Massamara. Uh, has, has anyone actually ever heard of Massamara Park? Oh, we got one. Excellent. Excellent. You saw like a movie or something like that, or did you, uh, or did you just know about it? Ah, good for you. That's excellent. So yeah, there's actually a recent president of the United States that actually says that this is, is his favorite place to go uh, because it's such a beautiful safari. Uh, when I was there, the, the, the neurosurgery team uh, from Indianapolis, uh, they actually went to uh, to like some, you know, very uh, affluent, uh, you know, safari. It cost them like $4,000 for like three nights or something crazy, you know. But uh, uh, the wildebeest crossing was at the time of year when I went. It's a wildebeest crossing that can be seen by space. So like Chris Hadfield in Nassau and stuff like that, they, he's actually seen the wildebeest cross from space. It is unbelievable. Also on planet Earth, if you guys want to watch planet Earth. <laughs> so um, this is actually, I think my last slide. Let me just see, one second. Uh, okay, I, I won't see. So I think this is my last slide. So how is, this, how is this valuable for our hospital? How is this valuable for all of us here uh, right now uh, in the context in which we live? Uh, number one, Personally, there is much to be learned, uh, and I took away a lot from a person, from a, you know, personally speaking. Number one, cultural humility was one of the biggest things that I learned, uh, and appreciation, uh, you know, for, for this for this culture. Number two, gratitude. We should all be continuing to 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 be growing in gratitude. And number three, growing in our awareness of how medicine is practiced, uh, so that when we do want to intervene, when we do want to help, when we do want to support, and do want to engage in these efforts, like we are today. That we would be fully aware of what of what and of how medicine is practiced over there. Next, relationally, uh, it is very very uh, important that we uh, sorry that's my personal perspective that it's that we engage in efforts like this. Um, uh, there is a lot that we can learn from them, and there's a lot that 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 that, said it, that they can learn from us. Uh, at the same time, I had to navigate that pretty carefully because you can imagine that. I'm not doing my time, by the way. Okay, I'll speed this up. But you can just imagine when I was there, I didn't want to come in there, you know, and be giving orders, even though there was so much to change. Because you can imagine if someone came from, I don't know, came from a, a leading hospital in Africa and was on one of our teams, if we're rotating in the hospital, and they're like, wow, you guys, like this is like, oh my heavens, it's depressing. You know, you guys need to change this, 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 this. Like that, that did not need to happen. You know, but like you can't do that. You can't just, you can't do that. You have to have the, you know, the emotional intelligence, you have to have the racial intelligence uh, and the wisdom to know how to navigate these relationships and how to affect change. Uh, next, I'll just be through these next ones professionally. Be aware of AMPATH. It's very, it's a very good uh, co cooperation and uh, collaboration. Um, I hope that this presentation can inspire um, and actually, um, you know, cause some zeal for individuals to be engaging and possibly even going uh, on these trips. Uh, can promote research and uh, promote education. Okay, this is actually, I think my last, yeah, okay, this is actually my last slide. This is an excellent opportunity if you wanna go, accommodations are included, meals are included. There's partnerships that you don't need to start from the bottom up. Like you don't need to go find a medical school. Everything's already set there. You have multidisciplinary teams that are just outstanding. You have full administrative support, full support from the program, full support from the foundation, Ascension's foundation program, which I believe we have some donors actually here today, uh, which I'm incredibly uh, grateful for, uh, and Heidi, uh, Dr. Dunaway, uh, to be fully supporting this endeavor as well. So just being in an environment that's incredibly supportive, it's just amazing. Uh, and lastly, uh, I just wanna thank you all for your attention. Um, and does anyone have any, any questions? I think we got like five minutes, four minutes. Oh, I think uh, let's just use the microphone here, Tabo. So first of all, I was respected by your presentation. Wonderful, Jim. Thank you. Did you pay for the presentation for the uh, accommodation? 
Yeah, so with regards to finances, and I, and I can be entirely open about that, that's fine. Um, so with regards to the finances, um, all in for eight weeks. So yeah, for two months, the whole trip, flights, accommodations, everything, it costs about $4,500, so 4,500. Um, that's including the, like everything. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So uh, my question goes, is about something that you and I talked about actually when you first came back. Um, I think you had a scenario where uh, it was a very traumatic uh, code mm -hmm. that did not end well. And it was about the debriefing that you did with a medical student and a certain question she asked. I was wondering if you could share that and kind of think about what your insight is that then, then when it happened, then also now that you've had more time. Yeah, excellent question, uh, Rody. Thank you. With regards to that question, that question still stays in my mind today, and that question still uh, rings in my ears. Um, so we had a very, very traumatic, I had a very traumatic experience. Oh, sorry, sounds like very grim already. But we had a, a gentleman that was actually 16 years old. He had angiosarcoma, a rare type of cancer that was from his, that was you know found originally in his spine and had spread uh, unfortunately. Palliative care is not where it is. We have some palliative care specialists here today who are excellent. And unfortunately, that specialty really hasn't emerged as it has in America. So there's really, you know, the insights quite forward there is the patient regarding his prognosis and everything like that. And he coded right in front of us. And he had a very um, uh, distressing death, like truly panting, gasping, crying out for us, help me, help me, you know, with like fear, panic in his eyes, his face turning white, I'm starting to foam. Like, like it was literally almost something that, you know, it's the kind of stuff that just stays in your mind. And the medical students were really shaken up by this, just as I was shaken up. And I, and I see a lot of death. And like, we see a lot of death. Or not a lot of death. Like, we see death, you know? Our hospital is great. But yeah, but we, yeah, no, we, we, we see death. But um, with regards to uh, this, this, when it finished, um, I wanted to debrief with the team. And so I brought the team together. And I said, um, with what you just saw, what is upon your minds? What's upon your hearts? Let's talk about it. Because uh, that was really overwhelming. That was a lot to see and a lot to handle. You know, and we had a team of five. You saw the big team there on the image. And the first person raised his hand and he said to me, um, why would God allow this to happen to that boy? And I thought to myself, oh my heavens, I've never had um, a question like that before, you know, in a, in a clinical setting, you know, um, where, you know, faith is very important to me, but actually to see that, uh, see that spiritual mindedness in other people, it really, really was quite moving. And I answered him. Um, and then the second, you know, from my perspective, and I shared this is my perspective, and I shared it with him. And then the second individual, because I thought, oh, my word, that was a very moving question, you know? And the second individual <clears throat> who was like, you know, he was even, he was, you know, completely his own brain and everything like that, he says, how should I counsel the family, the mother specifically, about, um, about, it was something also about God. It was like the second question was, how do I counsel the mother with regards to, um, uh, for comforting of, of, of how God can comfort her? And I thought to myself, oh my heavens, like these are not the questions I'm used to. And I welcome them. I, I absolutely welcome them. But it really showed me just the, 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 the difference in mindset, the difference in like how, how they've integrated spirituality in their own wellness and how they, uh, you know, in all of their life. It was really, really, uh, uh, moving uh, to me to see, and it actually has, you know, brought forth more of that mindset to be having these conversations open, uh, you know, in, in teams. But that's what the conversation was. Any other questions? Oh yeah, I think Jesse has a question. Oh, we have another question sure. over there. Yes, you can just go there. Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very interesting presentation you've given, and I'm so glad I came this afternoon. Uh, going back to the slide where you had your daily schedule, and that seemed very fast-paced, and uh, really not a lot of time for you even at the bedside. So yeah. how did you get your time to uh, read the patient's chart, learn the history? Did you have the same board of patients every day, so you got be very familiar with their care, or were you transitioned throughout the hospital on a scheduled basis? And since you also had your fireside, you know, chats in the evening, 
who works evening shift and, and night shift yeah, is up at, at this facility? Is just, um, excellent excellent question. <laughs> I know it does seem overwhelming. Yeah, this question. What kept you from uh, being exposed to active tuberculosis, and how did you begin hygiene? Yeah, <laughs> Oh my! I'll give you some amazing bullet forms here. If I miss anything, please just let me know. Uh, I'll go in the inverse order because it's by my memory. It's like the most frequent things I remember. You know. So with regards to how I did hand hygiene, they do have uh, they have no hand hygiene on the walls. So there isn't all the Purell that we have. You know, within six feet of literally everything in the hospital. Um, we really uh, they, we just would carry a bottle of Purell upon the upon the. The, the cart that had all the patients' charts, we had 30 chart, paper charts, thick charts, uh, with a bottle of Pura. And we would get sanitize after every interaction, number one. Number two, um, I was exposed every day to, to tuberculosis. Uh, and, these, and this was not with you know negative pressure rings and everything like this. Everyone in the hospital was exposed to tuberculosis. I actually asked, um, there she is, Abby, Abby Horty at the back, our excellent program uh, 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 office director, and uh, I asked her before I went, can I have some uh, N95 sprays? And she's like, absolutely, take as many as you want. I'm like, excellent, I'll take like eight. You know, and I was there for eight weeks and every day, you know, that like lasted me the first week. And I was like, oh boy, like, this is, you know, this is not good. Like, I'm going to make that to like triple mask with like surgical masks. I didn't know what I was going to do. Sure enough, I was thinking too hard. I just had dinner. I asked everyone if they had masks. And they just had like, people sent them with literally like boxes uh, from their hospitals. The ground team actually had like, Three boxes that the hospital sent with them. And so um, every day we just have N95s given to us. So uh, by them, I just have them. And so N95s uh, is how I would protect myself. Uh, you didn't have gowns, you didn't have plastic gowns. They don't have you know money to be given gowns or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so that was that. So and I'm negative for my tuberculosis to I just did it. Okay. <laughs> and uh, with reference to uh Oh shoot! I only answered two of your questions. Or or some regular patient load. Oh, patient load. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, the patient census, and uh, and then the night team. There's no night team. There is there's no hospital at the night. It's just the nurses. So there's no no one to cover uh, if an emergency happens. If an emergency happens, the patient will die, and uh, and the nurses will have to do their best to try to have you know you know do as best they can. Um, so there's that. Next, yes, patient load was extremely overwhelming. And with that, um, you, uh, how do I say, during pre-rounds, you have about the same time. So during pre-rounds, you get to see the patients just about as long as you would during, you know, if I round here at the hospital. And with regards to a uh, follow-up afterwards, it's, uh, it's just a lot different and you just have to be adaptable. Um, uh, someone here in this room, that was quite wise said to me. Adaptability here is the number one characteristic of resilient individuals. And that was ringing in my ear when I got over there because I was like, this is over moment, you know. And so I had to be adaptable. And with that, it was uh, knowing that uh, I can't counsel, you know, 30, like 18 patients in this ward and 18, pa like 18 patients in this ward with an English barrier. So how can we delegate the responsibilities? And we did. And that's how it, that's how it worked. I hope I answered all the questions. Yeah. Hey, Kier, I have two questions. Number one, the question that you wanted us to remind you about, how did the sisters manage mm. these patients? And you've already spoken a lot to how humbling this experience was, but I imagine that that word's going to come up quite a bit in the difference of roles and how they manage their patients. Mm. And then number two, again, looking at your typical day schedule, I'm also intrigued by the outline of that because you also had to eat meals and you talked about what you did in your free time to kind of focus on your wellness, but in, in actuality, how much time did you really have to do that and how much sleep were you getting? Absolutely. Good question, Jesse. So with regards to the um, <clears throat> with regards to the uh, first question, the nurse that actually asked me that question is here in this room currently, which is excellent. Uh, and she said to me, how did you, how did the nurses navigate? Like they're not superhuman. How did they carry 34 patients? You know, if our ICU patients carry two patients for the whole shift, you know, one nurse to two patients, how do they carry 34? And the thing is, uh, oh, sorry, she said, how do you, how do they care for them well? And the answer is, they don't. They don't. They do the best they can do. They do the very best they can do. And these nurses are hustling. Hustle, sorry, these sisters are hustling, hustling, hustling. They're busy. They're like sweating. 
like constantly, like they are so busy. But I mean, even if they focused on like seven ICU patients, like equivalent, like ICU equivalent patients, the other, you know, 28 patients will not be getting the care that they need. We have patients that literally miss like antibiotic doses of like meropenem, like really important to get. Like we had patients that had like multi-drug resistant organisms and yes, we could diagnose those. And they would literally miss like three days of antibiotics because nurses do not, they did not have time not again, not because of, you know, slothfulness, they literally were so busy, they, they could not tend to 34 patients. So the answer is, they could not do it well. They did the best that they could. And uh, they probably did much better than even I could, uh, if I, you know, was in their shoes. Uh, and then the second question that yes, that, you know, that, that schedule does look a little uh, overwhelming. <clears throat> Uh, with regards to how, how, how do you find, you know, uh, I just had to be really, really jealous of my personal time and had to be really, really protective over my personal time. Uh, otherwise, you know, I don't know, the conversations can just prolong at the dinner table with, with a lot of individuals. And it's good, you know, like the, the neurosurgery routine, like, you know, having, you know, a couple extra drinks or something like that. And that wasn't, you know, that wasn't my, you know, cup of tea and stuff. So I would essentially just, you know, you know, retire to my room and I would uh, uh, have, have my, you know, have the quiet time, call my wife, call my family, <clears throat> you know, uh, you know, do what was important to me. And so, yeah. So that's how I, that's how I would handle it. But, uh, and, and I actually had, I had uh, a number of weekends off. So this was not seven, this is not, you know, you're working for eight weeks nonstop. You had weekends off, but there's a couple weekends where you work week, that's right, there's a couple weeks where you work weekends. So you could see like, just like the pandemic, like, so you could see just like the, how different it is on weekends versus weekdays. Hello. Hey, hey, I'm here. Uh, so good presentation. I, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Thank you. Um, you and I spoke briefly about your experience in the emergency department. Yes. And what that was like mm -hmm. for you. Uh, and then also you spoke about the feeling that you had when the gentleman mentioned the 40 inch screen TV and not mm. having box nerves. Yeah. How do you feel now when you go and see a patient in the ER and mm. what kind of flashes through your mind? Mm. Yeah, excellent question. So first with regards to the ER experience over there, Dr. Lundy was uh, unlike, like almost otherworldly to our ER. Um, the patients are incredibly, incredibly sick. There's there's a lot of patients that will just die in the in the ER because they can't be transferred. We had a number of unbelievable, like we had a number of gruesome domestic abuse women that uh, did not actually like it, like it was just like when you walk in there, you, you you feel like you can't even breathe. Like you actually feel like you can't breathe. It's almost like no air because the rooms are so you know stuffed. The hallways the hallways are just packed. You know, like to, to, to even come across the corner, you come across the corner and it almost feels like there's no oxygen in the room and it's hot and cleaning and everything like that. And the nurses, again, they're doing the best that they can. Uh, the registrars are doing the best that they can. But, you know, the, the ER was, was even, I don't say even more, but, you know, was, was what I presented anymore with regards to what they have to handle. And when I'm <clears throat> having to navigate conversations now, like you're saying, uh, if people, you know, say that their television's not working, you know, I want to talk with your manager. You're like, why would you guys ever do that? You know, I'm completely displeased, you know, that type of stuff. Again, I have to just watch my heart. You know, I have to, I, first of all, I have to check my own heart, uh, make sure that I'm not going to be answering them, you know, uh, uh, you know, in an unkind or unbalanced, you know, because that's, again, if that's super important to them, you know, wonderful. But uh, again, trying to be as balanced as I can, but having a very different perspective now. And uh, just trying not to, you know, let that throw me off my my pendulum, you know. And uh, and uh, was there any other, did I miss anything in your question? No, just basically the reaction that you have viscerally. Yeah, oh yeah, viscerally, yeah, it almost like, it almost, it almost sends like, it almost like insects crawling on your skin when you hear a complaint like that, after you literally saw what you saw. Like after you had to navigate what you navigated and you see that, you almost feel like a visceral, I don't want to say anger, but it's like displeasure or it's like, um, how do I say? It? What's that? It's a dissonance. Yeah, like just this dissonance, like just this grief. Like, oh, it's just grief. Like I just grieve that, like, that, you know, that people are even saying these things when, you know, when they literally are having better care than you could not tell sometimes. Like, oh, thanks, dude. That was wonderful. Um, 
some of the students were in, came of age in the HIV era, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you came of age in the COVID era. Mm -hmm. uh, we, mm -hmm. we were talking about that at an IU meeting, and we have residents who never knew what it was like to practice medicine mm -hmm. before COVID. Has it changed your perspective on having become a practicing physician during COVID? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I would say it's changed, changed my perspectives in a number of ways, Dr. Ficklar. Uh, number one would be uh, having to navigate. Uh, if I did not see the death that I've seen during COVID and I went there, I'm actually not sure how I actually would have handled it, to be honest. Um, getting to see, you know, the, you know, the amount of death that we did during COVID, number one, having to navigate the familial um, dynamics and having to have these family conversations, working with the palliative care nurses and really relying upon them a lot um, with regards to all of this um, and just understanding you know, the team-based and depth delegating care. That was really, really important. But with regards to when I got over there, there was a lot that I think I would be completely, completely unprepared for um, uh, if I did not go through the code. And then just quickly on the second point, um, there is like a blend, if not like, like there, the HIV is still like incredibly present and uh, really, really sad cases a lot. Like a lot of patients had HIV and uh, were, were unable to afford medication, were unable to get medication. You know, 15 year old boys that got it from vertical transmission from mothers and everything like that with advanced HIV, like in AIDS, in full blown AIDS and everything like that. And I don't see that in America. Like I truly don't see that in America. So completely different pathologies and everything like that. So there's even like a hybrid too. So yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. Dr. Butler. So, thank you, Kira. It's been, a, been fantastic hearing about your experience. Um, and so, as your advisor the past three years, I know that we've had a lot of opportunities to talk about your future career and yeah. uh, you've always had a passion for, for global health. Mm -hmm. um, now that you've come back from this experience, how, how do you see um, how do you see incorporating that into uh, your future practice? Yeah, excellent question. Um, I really have a huge interest in global health and getting to see the model that they have is truly something like, uh, it, it showed to me that I don't need to recreate the wheel. And if any of you want to have this experience, you don't need to recreate the wheel. There's already wheels in place that you can get on board with. So number one, I want to be engaged with global health, uh, possibly even with AMPATH. Uh, and number two, uh, medical missions to me is, uh, is a goal. Uh, both my wife and I want to be engaging in that in the future uh, at Mayo Clinic. Um, the schedule that I will be on will be a seven on, seven off, seven on, seven off model, just like we have here at this hospital. And so it does make me wonder whether I could, you know, stack my weeks uh, in, in certain ways and then have opportunities to go on two to three week um, uh, trips um, there and engage in, uh, in, uh, in work overseas and possibly even local, um, uh, you know, that, which could function as, you know, the, the, you know, the mission model. So, yeah. They go in a big group. Go in a big group, Bob said. Yeah, Dr. Piccolora said, yes, absolutely. Yeah, going in a big group like this, you couldn't really go. Oh, Mayo goes in a big group. Oh, well, yeah, they do. Yeah, you're right. Mayo, Mayo is Mayo. So, yeah, they definitely do. On the higher side, are you going to give us a proper big I No, no, no. To, to be honest, uh, now that I've seen like a couple, it's actually uh, 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 shown me how like, how do I say? I, I don't I don't even know how they got trained the way they did because even when they were inserting it, I was thinking to myself like that sterile procedure wasn't even like he he thought it was in the right place. There's no bladder scan, like there's no ultrasound. So he's like, yeah, I think that's the bladder. Grabs a needle, you know, pokes it through the abdomen. I'm thinking to myself like, oh my heavens, to Betsy. So no, it's actually made me more uncomfortable with. Uh, with uh, you know. Any last questions? Well, I, I think it's a very good experience from a student perspective mm -hmm. too, and uh, we truly do not know how fortunate we are. Uh, mm -hmm. And unless you have it, you want to go crazy. You know, mm -hmm. um, some of us have a really good idea. Not as you know, the remote as this mm -hmm. place has been. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that I remember myself since, uh, coming in the morning, drying the lab, taking the samples to the lab. Coming back, see the patient before the tanning comes. Because once the tanning comes, if I, your, your eyes are gone, mm -hmm. your eyes are like that. Yeah. And you sweat, and uh, yeah. and then go and pick up the results and come back and do all those things. And 30, 40, 50 patients uh, are 
pretty normal. Yeah, exactly. But it also makes you realize that how oh, good experience you had. Maybe mm. not for a short period of time too long, but that they are discouraging that in my first in my uh, internship over there, in one year, I did out 300 at peace at the more functions in just one year. So, um, Was this in India? In India. In India? Yeah. yeah. Because we have had malaria, yeah. cell drivers, and green drivers, so all that. So, those kind of things. And we are really very fortunate, very, very fortunate. When I came there, Residency gave him a one on call. So, if somebody called me, he said, the patient needs to be done this. I didn't know that you could just write an order. For mm -hmm. me, but pick up a sleeve and go to the patient, leave the arm and draw the pen, and take it to the lab. And they said, patient needs that. I said, give me the stuff. He said, just the computer. I said, you didn't get it. What do you mean? Just the computer. I have to go to the. He said, no, just write it down on the computer. I pulled up and said, I said, no, why? She said, it's done. I said, what? All that's done. I haven't taken the blood yet. He said, no, you don't take the blood yet. You just, you know, I'm just telling you how fortunate yeah. you are yeah. and how fortunate our patients are also. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of perspective in the medication thing. So, you know, tuberculosis is very common in India. Mm -hmm. It's not only that you cannot provide the treatment, you can provide the treatment. But if you look at the most commonly affected member of the family is also the bread mm -hmm. But he's the one who's going out, who's mm -hmm. making money. He's mm -hmm. most likely to get exposed to tuberculosis and get that tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. So if also if you could hit them, say, okay, you stay home, you can do that. Mm -hmm. And if you give him a three months worth or six months worth of medication, most likely he's going to sell those medications because he can't eat for six months. So right. he's going to take for one week medication and then he's going to sell the rest of the medication and just do yeah. for that. And then we used to do that. We said, he'd come back. Um, every week or every two weeks, we give you medication. I know any of you remember streptomycin being given for the person that injected it for. So, those things we are very fortunate. And sometimes the other perspective we can't see from present perspective why they're doing it. But mm -hmm. we, are, we have to mm -hmm. for them to live one single day. Mm -hmm. It's really very hard. Yeah. So, I think from student perspective, a location like that is very, very important. Not this far, at least, you went to the extreme. Yeah. Uh, that tell you that how uh, fortunate we are, and really, my opinion makes you much better off in terms of treating the real mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure the experience you got over there in A3, you are really a true doctor. Mm -hmm. You have nothing else in mind, no administration was watching you, no conference, mm -hmm. no weapon, you know what. You are really doing the resources that you had, and you have to ask whether anybody mm -hmm. else other than your own conscience. Mm -hmm. Am I right? That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And I mean, I didn't even touch on diabetes management. I mean, insulin has to be refrigerated, right? Yeah. Like it has to be refrigerated or else it goes bad. When you're going back into Timbuktu, like when you're going into the middle of you know these rural communities and they don't have electricity and they literally only make $400 or $800 for the year, you know, the insulin is going to be going bad, even if, you know, we give like, all I'm trying to say is just like you're saying, the, the, the actual the problems and the answers that we come up with, and even that I was creating in my own minds, would I would find fault with. You know what I mean? Like it's so much larger than that. Yeah. So we used to, you know, auto play leaders, and once in the emergency room, uh, each guy comes, we won't play with what we're doing, even if we need that to speech it, we ask him to bring 50 disposable fringes. Why 50? You need to speak because the rest of the night, all the poor people are going to come mm -hmm. instead of using the auto play mm -hmm. because this guy can pay him for the use of those, you know, this wow. Wow. So It's very different. It's yeah. really a great medicine. Yeah. 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 No, 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 no. You definitely have your own gloves. I mean, they have their own infectious disease nurse, or and they have their own infectious disease like in, uh, uh, administration program. But uh, I mean, they had an Ebola tent in case Ebola uh, came to El Dorado because it's only like a hundred miles away and in Uganda. Uh, so they have their own infectious disease programs, uh, but they it's not to the same stand, like it's not to the same you know degree that we have. But they definitely have gloves. Yeah. Did your wife let you come back home for the next day or you have to stay in the She home? almost didn't kiss me because I had a beard. <laughs> she did. <Yeah. laughs>